we've been missing you. Do you want to find the witch friends you've been missing? Do you want to participate in these conversations live? And do you want to support the work of recovering a true history of feminist ideas about magic? Do you want to hang out? Do you want an invite to Zoom together with Amy and myself every new moon along with our hilarious, diverse, wise, queer, creative, anti-racist, science, and awe-loving coven? You must join the Missing Witches Patreon. It's pay what you can and we can't wait to meet you there. Patreon.com slash Missing Witches. The Dear Mother is coming. Happy Yule. <laughs> Happy Yule. Blessed Yule. Blessed fucking ice rain Yule. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of that. My a whole, lot of that. Yeah, my whole yard is like a luge, basically, at this point. Like, I just like steady myself and then slide over to the wood pile and gather my yeah, wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, as you may be able to tell, um, uh, stop bonking around on my desk. Uh, this is the first time, this is the first time in time that Amy and I are just doing an episode together. We're really stoked. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how. But it's like we, we plan to do a lot of stuff with this episode and then sort of said fuck it to everything. I think um just wanted to hang out. Uh and so welcome. We just we just want to be together and be with you and like celebra morn <laughs> something together and just like raise a glass. So yeah, welcome to the Yule special. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a funny one, winter solstice, because you know we have all of the sparkly, twinkly Christmas stuff that we uh, are supposed to be really excited about and filled with the spirit. Um, but us witches know that uh, um, the celebration is reactionary to a big piece of darkness. You know, we we celebrate to uh, to like literally keep our lights on <laughs> at this time of year but I think that there's also something to be said for you know sitting in the dark and I think that our culture is like against that you know is against sitting in, in the dark not just because of the advent of electricity and electric lights that you know have banished the night from our lives but this like I don't know, maybe I'll dive into what I brought because I, I really think that this goes along with all of this. Um, listeners, I'm sure you know by now, um, when you listen to this episode uh, a week from now, it'll be a week ago that Bell Hooks died. And, you know, she's quoted in our first book. And when I was um, researching Faith Ringgold, I was so fucking ecstatic to learn that Bell Hooks had written about Faith Ringgold. It's like, you know, when you're looking at the spider web and you see those little connected bits and it just makes everything seem like you're on the right path. And, you know, like the, <laughs> the spirit world is like encouraging your path. It was one of those moments. Um, so we're, we're big fans of hers. I didn't necessarily agree with everything that, you know, she wrote. But like, I, I don't agree with everything that my husband says either. And, you know, we're happily married. I don't think you have to agree with everything that someone says to respect them and <laughs> yeah. admire them. And... <laughs> I don't think I agree with everything I've ever said. So I'm, oh, my I'm goodness. Comfortable God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, somebody said what, I don't know who it was, but like, that like, yeah. it's 
it's not a bad thing to like look back at your past self and cringe because that just sort of shows you how much you've grown you know like if you can look yeah. at your past self and kind of be like oh then that's a good indication that you've you've come pretty far from that person you know Right. And just, it makes me think of that image of the spider web too. Like so many times when I say something and then I cringe later, which I am just like a notorious cringer, like on the bus out loud cringing, you know, <laughs> like I just, I, <laughs> I try to remind myself, like, not only am I like growing and learning, but also like some of the sense in that unique moment in the web you know like things are context specific like there there's no real trying to be absolutely right makes no fucking sense like it's just way too complicated so that might make sense in a really specific set of circumstances a specific moment in the network along the lines you know but this this old spider has been crawling around she's seen some other shit since so. but yeah <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about, like, like we need to have a place where we can sort of, like, talk experimentally. You know what I mean? Like, uh, when, we're, when we're having yeah. conversations with our friends and the people we love, like, we're not defending our theses, you know what I mean? Like, you, you shouldn't have to feel like everything that you say is, is right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like Reese right. and I do this all the time where we're just kind of bouncing and, and stretching and molding and, and we're like, maybe this is a good idea, but I'm not sure, but I'm going to say it to you anyway, just in case, like, you can take that and make it better. So, yeah, I mean, yes. I, I vote say cringy things. They, as long as you're not hurting people, like cringe at yourself and not at other people <laughs> in a vocal way. Yeah. A bell hooks quote from uh, her book, All About Love. And I really, you know, we've been talking about this, about the communal trauma that we've all been going through for the past couple of years that obviously, you know, it's affected us all differently and everybody's, you know, lived experience of the past couple of years is different. But, um, what we have been through has has been largely communal and it, and it requires a sort of communal healing that I haven't really seen taking place in any kind of large way obviously in our in our coven you know we we take moments to to talk about the realities of the situation you know and not just how or pretend everything's great um anyway once again I've traveled far but uh, now I'll return. So in All About Love, she wrote, Rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. And also in, um, in another piece, which was it? Okay, this is from Yearning race, gender, and cultural politics. Uh, Yearning is the book that I, I quoted from where you can find that uh, Faith Ringgold I quoted from in our first book. Um, Bell wrote, true resistance begins with people confronting pain and wanting to do something to change it. True resistance begins with people confronting pain and wanting to do something to change it. So, I, I mean, again, it, it, it's interesting to me that uh, Bell passed on to the next realm as we're coming up on our longest, darkest, for those of us in, in our hemisphere anyway, part of the year. And so much of her writing is about healing and resistance and talking about things and not being silent. So I guess like Bell Hooks is going to be my Christmas angel this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want to spend some more time with that with their thoughts on love. 
love is an action, love is a community. Um, yeah, I'll take bell hooks as my as my Christmas spirit, my Christmas angel this year. Yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, we sort of have been trained in our weird patriarchal capitalist society to suffer in silence, um, to pretend everything's great all the time, lest we, you know, let anyone discover that we're not perfect. Um, and it's not healthy and it doesn't help and it doesn't fix anything. And, you know, I, I do it too. I'm like a pretty private person generally, like my personal stuff is pretty personal to me, but I have always found that um, talking about it with somebody else helps. I mean, it, it's not like a solution oriented you know like you go to the mechanic and the mechanic fixes your car <laughs> and then you go home and your car is fixed like you know our lives don't work like that our souls don't work like that but in a, in a micro way they kind of do in a tiny way we just want things to be fixed we want easy fixes we want them to happen fast we want everything to be accessible with you know a credit card number and an internet connection and unfortunately i don't think that our our humanity has has caught up to our technology who is there's like a harvard business this is a pretty famous quote and i i will look up who said it but he said we have I'm going to misquote it, but something like Neanderthal brains, medieval systems, and godlike technology. And that's what we're contending with these days. You know, Neanderthal brains, medieval systems, and godlike technology. And, and I think it's starting to come to a head now in the 21st century that like, that is difficult to navigate <laughs> and we were just supposed to pretend that it wasn't but it's difficult to navigate yeah i think the the most like compelling message for me for this season um i just i keep hearing it like i don't know i I went yesterday to the spot in the woods near here, like space, as it was getting dark and it was like ice, everything's covered in snow and it's like this click, 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 click sound of like ice rain hitting snow. I hadn't been outside all day and I was just like crumply and grum grumpy <laughs> and uh, like walked these like paths through the woods to this place near here that's a wetland. May calls it um, bulrushes because there's bulrushes there that at the right time of year you can you know wave them around and they're all fluttery. And now it just looks like this like dark kind of creepy path weaving away in the white covered rocks because the only part that isn't covered in snow is the stream. And I just could hear resounding in my ears like say true things say true things say true things and I keep hearing that everywhere I go tell the truth tell the truth tell the truth say true things say true things say true things and I think it's like we have to keep listening to our bodies and our biomes and the species around us that are like screaming at us and our own pain our own like bones and organs that are not fucking well and tell these weird truths like we can't we can't stay in this like on the on the on the shiny surface you know we can't keep pretending everything is okay we can't keep like opening up a gap and then and then like hiding hiding away again our our true weirdness I mean, we can, maybe that's how we do it. We open it up little by little and protect ourselves as we do it. But, but that's like the, that's, that's, that's all I can hear right now is like, tell the truth, say weird things, 
say true things, you know, I think that's, that's all I got. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's all I got. You know, and, and some of our listeners know, you know, that I have a, a chronic illness. Um, I have hypothyroidism, which, I mean, if you're going to have a, a chronic illness, it's not the worst one to have, you know, <laughs> um, but I mean, there are pros and cons to that because it's invisible, you know, I can't walk into a room and people know that like I'm, you know, at a two energy level instead of a, and a seven and I'm, I'm used to, you know, having an ebb and flow with my, with my energy levels and with my wellness and I'm sort of like learning not to beat myself up about that and just kind of you know go with that if you know knowing that the energy will come back um but this fall I just was all ebb and no flow all ebb and no flow (laughs) um and so I made a doctor's appointment I mean that that's the kind of like <laughs> that's the kind of honesty that I'm dealing with right now is like recognizing okay like I'm in this space and I need to talk to somebody about it and you know I need to get my blood retested I need to you know get my hormones tested I need to I need to do the things that I need to do to get out of it because it's not just going to happen on its own necessarily and it's a big it's a big lesson for me having to sort of have this vigilance about my own body that i never really like i always i always sort of felt separate from my body you know mm-hmm. like i think a lot of us have this like mind body dilemma you know a lot of us sort of feel totally. it especially people with, you know, chronic pain or chronic illness or, you know, dis-ease of any kind. We sort of just feel like it's just a prison, you know. I'm just trapped in this body. Um, and I've been, this is one of the things that I'm working on is sort of re- resolving the mind-body dilemma and trying to figure out how to be better without putting that, like, capitalist pressure on myself of like pushing myself to the point where I'll break and thinking that that's like what good smart successful people do is push themselves until they die <laughs> you know <laughs> that's sort of the that's sort of the message you know the the 80s yuppies bragging about their 80 hour work week and that was what we were supposed to think was good and right so uh, yeah for me it's it's been very much like this negotiation between trying to get better be better and also trying to like just be cool with who I am and what I am and and what my limits are do you know what I mean like I know I know you've had pain struggles and recently and part of it is like wishing your body would go away and then the other part is like trying to be kind to it and and nurture it and Mm -hmm. totally I and it it that's an ongoing like conversation within my body for sure i think for me um so i had that migraine that lasted 10 years after i had these bad falls and that was very much a that was a 10-year process of pulling further and further away from my body like almost like a imposed paralysis by a part of me that I wasn't totally conscious of most of the time that was trying to protect me from pain and emotional pain and physical pain and like pull away away and like build this armature you know high up in my shoulders and tight in my neck and like build like the just to be as hard as possible as straight as possible as good as possible and that is often the story of chronic pain is that there's a moment of of injury or of trauma but it becomes chronic in the way that the body tries to protect itself which is also how our relationship with our shadow works right like the shadow is becomes 
bigger and and larger as I always say she for me we see her but she tries to protect me you know so my shadow self her impact is very destructive but her desire is very protective she's just trying to like do what she thinks will help based on the knowledge of what she has you know and so I built this like this like ultimately very violent armature of protection that was perpetuating the pain, perpetuating the numbness, you know, across half my body. And I, I could only, you know, I, I would see these auras almost all the time. And, um, and coming out of that was this weird backwards process of like coming back in to my body and telling her like, thank you, you know, like, yeah, th- I see, I see what you're doing there, thank you, you know, like, I, okay, you know, like, I would stand up and sit down with, and stand up and sit down and feel like the, like, shell clamped on really hard, and like, everything got really hard and violent, and be like, oh, okay, and then just sort of try to dance it out a little bit, breathe, ease it out a little bit, like, touch my skin, touch my arms, touch my shoulders, be like, thank you I see I see what you're trying to do it's okay you don't have to do that now but thank you I see thank you you know and just like not try not to get mad at myself and and now I'm like in another version of it with food where I'm like I I'm I have like my my insides are in pain often when I eat and I've been in the same kind of denial about it because you know with May's allergies we've just had to limit our food so much and food is so to, to, to fear. And so we've got food kind of figured out in a way that's safe for her and it's fun for us to cook and whatever, but it causes me so much pain, but I, and I haven't wanted to talk about it or look at it, you know, cause I was like, I can't, I can't fucking flip this apple cart again, you know? Yeah. Cause so it's like you finally kind of do it. Fine enacting the same pattern yes you finally found something that worked and then your body was like no I'm gonna throw a monkey wrench into these works (laughs) yeah Yeah, actually your biome is more complicated than that sorry you still need more there's something more you need so yeah but that I mean that's just it's just a kick in the pants you know when you finally you finally you know find something that you think is going to work and and you know it this happens all the time with with everything that we do in our lives we're like yeah and then and then one little detail is askew and it's like well <laughs> that's yeah that's not going to work but that's why we have but to maybe- you know we just i mean we, we we love this idea of the quick fix of the of the of the finish line you know we love this idea of a finish line, especially if it's something that we can buy and have delivered to our houses. But like, I think, you know, with, with my illness, with your illness, it's like we just have to accept that, it, that life is a constant process, right? Like we just have to accept that. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've thought before about how like, I was spiraling my way out of like controlling relationships or whatever. And I, I took further and further steps out. And in some ways I speaking of like love relationships, you know, I took further steps out. I learned something. I went back around the spiral again. You know, I learned, oh, I chose that fucking shit again without realizing it. <laughs> went back around again. And then like, you know, with each step, like kind of spiraled out. And I think that's just, the pattern you know that's just the geometry of life it's the it's the sacred spiral getting wider and wider and more expansive and adding space each time around but you're just on you're just on a spiral you know you're just you're just atoms and light on a (laughs) wave spiraling around doing your you know doing your thing like what else do you expect you know like i can't remember what we were looking at some kind of space documentary and I had this moment where I, I literally turned to my husband and I was like, we need to put on something else. Like, I can't deal with just like being on a rock hurtling through space right now. <laughs> like, I just yeah. can't notionally deal with the fact that I'm just like a meat sack hurtling through space on a giant <laughs> rock right now. <laughs> 
I just don't yeah. have it in me to contend with that. But ultimately, yeah, like the the further you get into, you know, quantum physics and you know, biology and the roots of the roots of the, you know, what's between the atoms, like the more magical, and I mean that in the, in the unknown way, it seems. Yeah. And sometimes I, I go down these paths and I get really excited and it makes me feel really excited. And then sometimes it's just like, it's just too much. Like, my brain can't handle the vastness sometimes. You know what I've been going back to um, in our Samhain special, um, Becky Lyon had did it like an amazing opening Ooh, sort so of ritual. Good. So good. And one of the things I've been left with that I is um, smelling your elbow she's like because she offers right. all these different <laughs> all these different ways of like like kind of coming into your senses and coming back in to sort of being an animal embodying and the, the sort of like magic in this 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 moment and the one that i keep going back to is like putting your face burrowing your face like a little animal in your elbow and like smell your own pheromones and it's so like kind of sneaky pleasurable and, yeah. and totally grounding and totally like I'm a I'm a I'm a cute smelling little meat sack spiraling <laughs> yeah. through space at least but it is it's like it's like a, I just did it while you were talking about it listeners take a second put your nose in the in the crook of your elbow the inside of your elbow <sighs> take a big sniff and it really it there is something extremely comforting about it you know we are very um scent driven animals um they say that like that scents bring back memories like more strongly than even like sights um but it it's like a homecoming listeners stick your nose in the crook of your elbow and and just let the rock hurtling through space fade away and just be in your own <laughs> little, you know, uh, society. I mean, we know this too. We've talked about this a hundred times. Like I think by weight, we are like more bacteria than self. So <laughs> what, <is that? laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, 10 times more, something like that. Really? And the other piece I oh, yeah, Lord. it's huge. <laughs> yeah, and the, the other piece I love. Um, we'll have an interview going up with um, Jared K. Anderson from the Joe Naturalist. Just like a wonderful fucking poet. This was an amazing interview. It'll it'll come up in a week or two after this one. Um, and in one of his pieces, he talks beautifully about how uh, by the time you die, you will have let, like shed more skin and hair and nails and, and body matter, like vastly more than what's left when you die. So like, you're already out there. You're already outspread around the world. You know, the, the transition is not so extreme as it seems. Yeah, and I mean, that that's the, the thing about being a witch, right, is that, like, we have these, like, micro notions of, of, of being one with everything, but also, like, separate from everything, but also one with everything, and, and I love when these bits of science come up um, that are just like, yeah, you, you've already left a trail of hair everywhere that you've been, and skin, you've left this, like, this mark on the world, you know, you already have. Yeah, you, you're a web out there in the world of memories and impact and sounds and also photos and clips of video and recordings and the idea that you can, through ritual or just, you know, an, an intense relationship with yourself and your body and your biome, reach out into that web 
<laughs> and change the present, change the past, change the future is not such an extreme step. You can hear my family singing in the background, guys. <laughs> Are they so, singing you know, Christmas carols? Is that is that? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. I just hear hollering. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. We know that from Elf <laughs> and yeah. from our uh, from our adventures. But yeah, again, I mean, I just like that's one of my favorite things about being a witch is is knowing that I am like so minuscule and so vast at the same time, and like being cool with both of those states. You know, sometimes it, they might throw me for a little bit of a loop, but ultimately, like. I'm cool with being vast. I'm cool with being microscopic. And maybe uh maybe Yule time is a good good time to get into that. You know, I think all the time about how new electricity is. This is one of those things that I think about, you know, classic stoner. <laughs> but how new electricity is. I think about that all the time. Like electricity is what, like 150 years old, something. And before that, it was just like darkness was like allowed and it was a thing. And Risa, by the time you and I were born, like darkness wasn't necessarily even a thing. Most of us, <laughs> I would say 100% of the people who are listening to this podcast right now have never <laughs> experienced a world without electricity. And of course, like we go camping or we do whatever and we can like sort of create those moments. But I wonder all the time about how it would have been to light a candle. And I think that's something that I'm going to experiment with as we get closer to the winter solstice our longest, darkest night of the year is that I, I really think that I'm going to do like a one, one night by candlelight at least, or like really like turn off the electricity. And just even see yeah, that's, that's like. That's. That's so funny. It's really become an important part of Yule for me. I think I mentioned this in a, a coven circle, but not on the podcast. But I, uh, I had this strange experience where I, um, years ago, like I threw a, a holiday party before we'd started the podcast, but I was in some witch classes, witch circles, and sort of in that work and education. And uh, I threw a holiday party and I went and got all these evergreen boughs and put them in vases around my house and had candles everywhere, fruit, and baked goods, and whatever. And then after everyone left, cleared the table of everything except the candles and the boughs and sat in front of them and was just transfixed like just definitely felt lifted out and saw in the shadows uh I, I saw her as a horned goddess and I didn't know what that meant, but I wrote to her and and it was just like hit with this sense of the non-binariness of that and the power of her and them and it was just it's hard to describe. I don't know. You can it's it's like when uh, Marion Peck said, you know, you you have a dream about a bird and then you go look up what the bird means and you kill the bird. <laughs> by, by, so I had this this dream moment and I don't want to kill it by telling the story ever again, but this will be the second time I tell it. Um and and then over the years this sort of evolved into a Yule ritual that I've shared with other people of making the boughs and the candles, turning out all the lights, feeding each other fruit, maybe like maybe singing. And then 
I think this year for me, it'll be about as though we are next year, like writing, writing a love letter I want to hear or writing a look back on what from a love from myself to myself on on who I can be and what I can truth I can tell and and write some of that in the candlelight but then maybe also a practice I've done before is to blow out the candles and write the rest in the dark because it's you know automatic writing or channeled writing or spirit writing or just uninhibited body writing is is fun to do in the dark when you're you're not worried about reading it later because you're probably not going to be able to there's something about it yeah yeah so i'll add that i'll add that i think i'm gonna do that too for sure i'm gonna i mean Mm. last christmas um we went to my in-laws and they had lost power (laughs) <laughs> so yeah I mean there are times of course you know <laughs> when not by choice but we had you know lukewarm soup <laughs> around, the, around the table it was a lovely Christmas I mean it didn't it didn't change much about you know just the temperature of the food <laughs> but we still sat around the table and chatted and you know did the things that we would normally do they have a fireplace so we weren't freezing or anything you know yeah we still have so much that goes and you're like wow we have, we, have, we still have other layers of protection between us and that that ice wind it's yeah yeah I've, I've certainly so, romanticized I didn't live in Montreal when that big sort of legendary ice storm happened I think I, I did I, yeah. yeah, I moved to town a couple of years later. So for me, it's like this very romantic notion of like communities coming together and like people huddling around whoever had, you know, something that went, but, uh, but you were there. So <laughs> yeah. what well, was the reality? <laughs> it was both, you know, just like, just like we've been saying, it was both, it was, it was both like very communal and joyful and very terrifying and scary I remember I got intentionally and then unintentionally for a while separated from my parents and my little sisters I was like a teenager I went to sleep over at a friend's house but then they lost power I went to sleep over at another friend's house they lost power it's not like we had cell phones you know and my my house lost power and got too cold so my family went to one place and another we kind of just lost track of each other So that was scary. And one of the places I went to um, when the metros were still working, I can't remember if they stopped, but they were working. I came out of the metro and there was, this is a trigger warning. There was uh, someone who had just died right outside the metro, like an older gentleman had slipped and fallen and cracked his head open and there was blood on the ice. So it was very much like, but I, I spent a day reading Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe out loud to my sisters. My baby sisters cuddled in blankets, you know, and and then like stayed in a shelter in a high school one night and volunteered there. And then, you know, had partied with friends and watched horror movies because they had a generator and we used it just to power the movies. And then also like came as close as I, as I had ever been to and loss and and the sheer terror of like not knowing where my family was kind of came home at that point um and the trees just all the cracked trees on mount royal it's like a visual it was on every newspaper and on the news just like it was such a a metaphor and a reality that all of these old trees were just snapped in half by the weight of the ice Merry Christmas. <laughs> I feel like right now everything I put out in the world is like, um, sorry. <laughs> Happy holidays. I'm well, sobbing. I mean, you know, it's sort of, you know, it's it, it it's not uh it's not your fault that that Bell Hooks, you know, passed away the day before we're recording this, but you know, true resistance begins with people confronting pain 
and wanting to yes. do something to change it. So again, this is, this is a dark time. And, and how many times do we have to say to each other, like, you know, you don't need to be your best self at all times. You don't need to be chipper. It's unhealthy for us to only talk about how rad things are. You know, that's, yeah. that's what being a witch is to me. Yeah. You know? It's so funny. I wanted to go back to that, that, that tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. Right before we got on this um, recording, this episode, I was late because I was lost writing about Amy. We're doing this thing you may have seen on our Instagram by now where we, we, we took a moment to like introduce, like I'm introducing Amy, she's introducing me. It's sort of as an act of love. It's, it's actually been really beautiful. It's like all I want for Christmas is to know that Amy loves me and thinks I'm cool. And all I want to give for Christmas is tell her how much I love her and think she's cool. But um, I was writing about how you are this person who it's like your whole being is, and I didn't think of the relationship between these two thoughts until now, but it's like you are someone who calls out the truth and can't help but fucking say the truth when you see it. I mean that's your your mean anti-power for, for, like, for better for better and for worse <laughs> you can't God help it I mean, that's who you are. yeah it's got its pros and cons yeah um I think that's 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 pure magic I mean that's or oracular shit you know and I understand you know protecting yourself too and and being private I'm very much the same but, yeah, uh, and and maybe maybe that's why I am private because I know once I say something, <laughs> it I, that it can't be unsaid. But I do want to return because I wanted to bring this up too. Like, especially it's like it's gifting season, and you know, it is better to give than to receive, and all that. And I. It was such a joy to write that, my introduction of you, Lisa. And yeah. I just kept thinking about like, you know, some of us have had, have had letters of reference, you know, for jobs or graduate programs, whatever. Um, in school, I never got to read mine and I always wanted to. <laughs> and I think they're like private within the institution of the university or whatever. You're not supposed to see. I got to read mine? You didn't get to read yours? No. Oh, I want oh, I want that for I you know. so badly. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, like I, I got into the program. Pleasure. So yeah, I have to assume that they were okay. <laughs> but but I also like I was doing something very grown up and I needed to have a letter of reference from, um, you know, my bank or my accountant. And luckily, Risa, as you know, you know, you work with him now too. Like I've known my accountant since he was like a drummer in a punk band. I mean, he still is, but now he's he still like is. Very... He, he would insist. <laughs> <laughs> he would insist that you add the addendum that he is still. <laughs> that he still is, you know. Um, uh, <sighs> And so I needed to get a, a letter of reference. And I was like, oh my God, I need a letter of reference. And I was like, oh, I actually have an accountant. And I'm sure, you know, and he's also a friend of mine. So, so he wrote this glowing letter about how like responsible and, and you know, dependable <laughs> and, and, oh, and all so of nice. these things. And I was like, from an, from my accountant, like I was like, f have never felt more like an adult than in that moment right. where they were like, we need a letter from your an accountant. And I was like, I can provide that. <laughs> and you were like, I am master of the and mundane. Then, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cause yeah, all that, all that like adulting stuff, you know, like it is pretty anxiety provoking for me. Like this year I did my taxes for the first time without crying. <laughs> Not because oh, they're yeah. like complicated or like whatever. It's just like very fucking anxiety provoking for me. I just like, uh, anyway, all this to say, it was such a joy writing your introduction, Risa. And I want to encourage, it's gift giving season. Yes. I want to encourage all of our listeners to like, instead of buying something for somebody, you don't have to do this for everybody or even if it's yourself even if it's yourself write a glowing reference letter <laughs> write an introduction or something 
you know, like how you would, if someone was applying for a job and you had been their boss and you're going to write that letter of recommendation, write that for someone you love about how rad it is to know them. And oh it's God, even, yes. it's even easier. Like I, if I had had to write, like you are this and you are that it, I, I'm sure it would have come out completely differently, but because it was like, Risa Dickens is this. Risa Dickens is that, <laughs> you know? So I am very, very highly encouraged. And this is one of those things where it is equally beneficial to give and receive. Write someone a glowing recommendation for friendship or love or, you know, trustworthiness or intelligence or Yes, or I offer you this, which we did for each other was uh, as though you are introducing them to a party of soulmate witches. <laughs> yeah. Like, why doesn't we, uh, uh, like, uh, I wrote it, I sent it to you, and I was like, why doesn't everyone do this all the time? I know, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, yeah. You know? And I, I mean, I was sobbing when I read it. I had so much fun writing mine. I'm having so much fun writing mine. Yeah, I, you're so right. This is this is the spell of the season. I can't wait. I'm gonna go write like six more of these today. Yeah, a couple of years ago, um, when Amanda Yates Garcia wrote the foreword for our book mm. and sent it to us, and um, it just so happened to be on my birthday, and so yeah. like it was my birthday, and I was reading the most validating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like <laughs> someone just being like, like, yeah, this is this is great work, and here's what I got out of it. And I was like, ah, best birthday present ever. Still to this day goes down like best birthday present ever, without doubt. Yeah. So like we can do that. Why doesn't everyone do this all the time? We can just do this. It's a really good idea. I'm gonna add to to the idea of um, you definitely can and should offer this to yourself this season too. Um, and I'm going to add two pictures to that idea. One is uh, Sophie Strang, the episode with her one of today. It's one of the best episodes that I've had gotten to do. I, I was totally shattered by her and her writing. And uh, she told the end that every morning she calls in a council of every species being past present that she can think of in a 20 mile radius and she calls them by like loving made up names or the names she knows or their indigenous names so she calls she it's like a litany she calls invites in every organism every species every animal every like traditional landholder everyone that she can and invites them in to be like a council for her writing and her work that day and so imagine do that and then imagine you're introducing yourselves to that pantheon to that and then the second council (laughs) to the council (laughs) and then the other piece i'm going to add to that is uh May Marigold at two, walking along through this path in our forest that goes to the bulrushes and stopping and looking at these little evergreen trees that are like the same height as her. She kind of cocked her head and looked at it and then reached out and took one of the branches and went, hi, I'm May Marigold Dick and Seymour. <laughs> and went to the <laughs> next one. Hi, <laughs> my name is May Marigold Seymour. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, that's the thing about kids, right? Mm-hmm. Like the romantic poets, like I can't remember which one it was, would like go into the streets and shake babies. Like, tell me what you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't shake recommend babies. the shaking part. I do not recommend the shaking part. <laughs> but, bros. But, the, <laughs> but the demanding to know what, what children know, that yeah. part I can get behind for sure that mm. part I can get behind for sure there's just like I mean and you know the same thing has happened with us you know we sort of famously have become friends with the 
with the trees and the shrubs and the the things that yeah. around us and uh, I, when I was wa going up the ravine and sort of holding up holding on to branches and climbing the ravine and holding on to branches and climbing up the ravine and one of them snapped and I fell down on my bum and the first thing in my mouth was you're not my friend <laughs> <laughs> Like it was a totally unconscious, like that's just what came out of my mouth was you're not my friend. I think I I think I apologized after. I mean, you know, it's, surely yeah. it's not the branch's fault that I had yanked too hard. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I love think, think of a council and then a, a soulmate council, a council of all mm -hmm. beings that are in line, and then write an introduction to a loved one to that council mm. and and give that to your loved one write a letter of recommendation for friendship or love yeah yeah those are your spells for the yuletide season my friends yeah and maybe we'll close with bell hooks rarely if ever are any of us healed in isolation? Healing is an act of communion. Oh. Bless the fucking me. Bless the fucking me. <laughs> With your mother's coming. The Missing Witches podcast is brought to you by the Missing Witches Coven. Join us right now on patreon.com slash missing witches. Bless if I can be. Oh, you will find oh, solstice along oh, this night of the year. We can.